Modern e tailing with Python and Airflow and Spark, obviously. And um, yeah, it will be a 30 minutes talk with uh, five minutes um, QA at the end. So maybe prepare some questions and um, yeah, have a fun. Okay, good morning, everyone, and thanks for being here. So, um, like the presenter just said, I'll be presenting modern e tailing using Python, Airflow, and also Spark. Um, so what to expect from this talk, we'll go over what is ETLing and why I consider it still to be relevant, um, how Airflow can help you in this, and also what role Spark plays in ETLing. So a little bit of my experience for the past two years, I was working at HelloFresh as a data engineer, um, where we, I was in the team that built the data warehouse up from scratch, and we had a lot of ETLs running on production using Airflow. And before that, I was studying a very specific master's degree <laughs> called uh, IT for Business Intelligence. So while I'm not an expert in the area, I think over the past years, I've collected some experience that I hope can be useful for you today. Okay, so let's start with what's ETLing. So this term is actually, um, it means extract, transform, load, and it goes hand in hand with like the concept of traditional data warehousing. Um, but for me, actually, it's, it's just a process where you transform and possibly migrate data from one place to another um, for analytical purposes. So because so much has developed over the past 20 years in database technologies, kind of lots of people think or say they're, they're not doing ETLing because they're not doing it in the traditional sense. Um, but for me, actually, ETLing is still, is still quite relevant because you still need to transform data to make it more suited for analytics. And one important thing is that it usually implies batch processing. So some people argue, for example, that if you're using a Hadoop cluster, you're not actually doing ETLing, but you're doing ELTing, so extract load transform, because data is loaded as raw as possible to the cluster and then kind of transformed ad hoc. Um, but actually, if you're creating derived data sets that are meant to be used by different people than yourself, in the end, you are doing some sort form of ETLing uh, because you need to automate this and have the results materialized for other people to use. Um, streaming has some similarity to this, however, you notice I've graded out and it's because actually um, streaming has one difference to batch processing and it's that you actually, it's not agnostic to the data producing process. So this can make it a bit more complicated to implement um, and this is why some people or many people are still doing a lot of batch processing because you just take the data that has already been generated and then you process it after it has been generated. Okay, so because ETLing was such a big thing and, and comes uh, in line with data warehousing and before the 2000s, um, actually database technologies didn't really change much for the previous 20 years, um, there were a lot of vendor tools out there like high level drag and drop tools to do ETLing. And while they were very useful, um, I, I think there are lots of limitations to these tools. So the first one is that they're mostly designed to deal with well-structured data, and this is because most of them were built on the premise that you're migrating data from one relational database to another. And actually nowadays, or at least from my experience, um, one of the biggest problems is actually the variety of sources that you have, and not everything is a relational database anymore. You have now, Mongo, for example, or also lots of uh, data collection coming from third-party APIs. So these tools uh, haven't really evolved to integrate so well with, with these other sources. Um, but also, importantly, they're mostly not open source, so they can be pricey. And also what can be very frustrating, for, especially for a developer, is that if an operator is not working the way you expect it to, it's, you don't know why. So it's very hard to see into the code what, what's happening. Um, so I'm suggesting, or my, my suggestion is that instead we can use Python. And um, why Python? So first of all, it, because it's easy. So more and more I see people coming that are not coming from software development backgrounds who can code in Python, and it's a very useful tool for them. Um, also, it, it's way more flexible, and it allows you the possibility to create meaningful abstractions. So if you have logic that you need to reuse many times, you can create, you can encapsulate this in a function or um, whatever. And one very important thing as well is that you can test the logic. So this is actually very nice because 
if your pipeline, your data pipeline needs to evolve, if the logic needs to change for whatever reason, you can be confident that the change you're making is not breaking any of the previous functionality. Um, and of course, versioning and collaborating uh, on code is, is often easier than on high-level tools. Of course, it's important to note that it, this, the use of Python for ETLing is subject to organization culture. So if you're working for an organization where across the entire organization you're using a vendor software, it probably makes sense to use the ETL tool that this vendor software provides. So I, I understand that it's not a possibility for everyone to just go to Python. So I hope you're thinking that, well, actually, um, ETL, like high-level ETL tools have a lot of nice features that I'm not willing to give up uh, and just go to Python. And I actually, I agree with this, um, and I'll mention some of these features um, now. So one of them is the fact that you have explicit documentation. So in these drag-and-drop tools, you kind of connect operators together, and this gives you like a very nice view of the data lineage, so where your derived data sets are coming from. So this is a nice feature. On the other hand, um, you can also define dependencies between pipelines. So often, even though maybe all of the logic of your pipeline is contained in one, it might depend on other data sets that are derived on, from separate pipelines. So this is also nice. Um, finally, uh, also you have centralized scheduling. So this is also comes kind of hand in hand with um, having complex dependencies between pipelines because if you have them centralized in one place, it, it makes it a lot easier. And another nice aspect of high-level ETL tools is that normally you can configure data sources only once and then they can be used across multiple pipelines because it's common to share these. Um, and also very importantly is alerting and monitoring. So when you're uh, creating pipelines, you want to make sure you find out if your pipeline fails before the stakeholders of your data sets find out because you want them to trust these data sets that you're deriving as much as possible. And every time somebody comes back reporting, hey, something went wrong with the ETL, this is starting, so people are starting to lose trust in the data points that you're, um, yeah, that you're delivering. And on the other hand, there's also, so if you can see the task duration of your different tasks, um, it's possible to detect if there's some kind of a bottleneck in your pipeline. So this is uh, where Airflow comes in. So Airflow, in their own definition, is a platform to programmatically um, author, schedule, and monitor workflows. So they use workflow as like a broader sense. Um, actually, it was developed thinking about ETLing, but yeah, it's not limited to this application. Um, basically, Airflow, it's a Python tool. It's all written in Python, and it allows you to define your pipelines in Python as well. So here you can see a pipeline definition. You can see it's, it's very simple. So the workflows, they call them DAG for directed acyclic graph. And um, you can then um, create operators associated to this DAG and then set dependencies between these operators. So as you can see, it's very simple. Um, also, Airflow is open source, so this is really nice. You can easily extend it. Um, it uh, became a Apache incubator project uh, a year and a half ago. So this gives a sense that it's actually a project that's, that's growing and that has some nice support. So this is always something to take into account when you go into an open source, uh, like using an open source tool. Um, one aspect that's really nice of Airflow and that actually distinguishes it from other tools, for example, Luigi, um, is that it has the possibility to dynamically create pipelines and tasks. So this can be very useful if you're, for example, doing the same operator across. So say, for example, you're working at an organization that works across 10 or 20 different countries and you need to apply the same operations to each of those countries. You maybe don't want to have to define 20 operators separately, but you just iterate over a list of countries and then create them dynamically. So this is a really nice feature. So here's the basic Airflow architecture. I actually borrowed this from, <laughs> from online. I, I liked it a lot. So at the central point, you see the scheduler. This is kind of the main part to understand of Airflow. And what the scheduler does, it schedules executions of tasks in your DAG. And the way it does this is that it persists information about the status of tasks in this metadata database. So if the metadata database isn't available, uh, the scheduler won't be scheduling anything. It won't run. And one thing that's really important to know about the database is that DAGs are identified by their IDs. So if you see in the previous slides, this ID is normally like a string, which is something that is meaningful to represent the DAG. And if you change the name of that ID, of that DAG, because you think this other name is more meaningful, for the scheduler, this will be a whole new DAG. So this is important to take into account. 
Um, then on the other hand, so you can see the scheduler has different modes. So you, the sequential and local executors, what these modes are is that basically uh, the scheduler schedules tasks on the same machine where it's running. Whereas in the salary executor, the scheduler schedules tasks on different worker nodes. So this allows airflow to scale. So you can uh, scale to as many worker nodes as you want. Um, and then finally, the way you interact with Airflow on a high level is through the web server and web UI, which allows you to do all of these like nice uh, high level ETL you know, operations. Okay, so again, like I told you, understanding the scheduler is kind of key to understanding how Airflow works. So basically every DAG has a start date and a schedule, and the schedule you can define with cron notation. And what the scheduler does, as soon as you turn on or unpause your DAG, is that it'll schedule a DAG run for every scheduled period between the start date and now. So if you have a start date way in the past and it starts scheduling a bunch of runs, this is, this is why. Um, and the same if you clear tasks or DAG runs from the past, uh, the scheduler will rerun them uh, directly. So if you actually want to rerun tasks or DAG runs from the past, you can just clear them and the schedule will, scheduler will automatically rerun them for you. Um, yeah, so one thing that's important is if you want to clear previous executions of a DAG, you might just clear the task runs of that DAG. Um, so, but if you clear just the task runs without clearing the DAG run itself, then the scheduler won't um, schedule these because it has to see that the DAG run is not completed successfully to be able to schedule. And another thing to be aware of is the depends on past property. So what this property says is that if it's set to true, every task run depends on the task from the previous schedule to be successful. So if your previous task failed, then the future ones or the upcoming ones won't be triggered. So you either need to mark it as success or clear it or ideally make it run properly. So make sure what, what, what was the reason that it didn't run and then have it run. Okay, and also related to the scheduler, so there are two ways to make the scheduler not kind of catch up or backfill these tasks from the past. So the easiest way is to set the DAG catch up property to false. And there's also a latest operator, which what it does is that any downstream task to it will not be run unless it's the latest execution of that DAG. Um, and another thing that's super, super important to know and that's actually quite confusing for people using Airflow for the first time is that DAG runs are triggered when the period ends. So your DAG with execution date, for example, on the 25th of October will actually be triggered on the 26th of October if your period is like a daily run. So the intuition behind this is that DAGs run when the period has ended because they process the data from that previous period, so the data that was generated there. Okay, so um, one concept that's, or principles that are really important in ETLing is that you should be able to do incremental loads and transformations as well as historical. So incremental because you don't want to waste resources running your transformation on the entire history of your data every time. And um, historical because the first time you run a DAG or if there are fixes done to the source data, or if there's a change in logic of the DAG, you want to be able to rerun like all of history. Um, to be able to achieve this, so data should be immutable, and the transformations need to be reproducible. So you, you should make sure that if you clear a task and this task reruns, this won't generate a different uh, final data set, provided that the source data set is the same. Um, and a nice feature that Airflow provides to be able to do incremental loads is that it provides variables of the execution date that are available through Jinja templating. So this is really nice. Um, VS, for example, is the execution date, and you can do different functions on these, on these variables. Um, our approach to doing uh, historical and incremental executions was actually, in most of the cases, to create two DAGs so that are just very similar, but that are parameterized differently. So your historical DAG would only run once and the incremental DAG, for example, with the schedule that you want it to have. Um, and if you need to rerun the history, you can just clear the DAG run and have it run again. Okay, so one thing that you might be tempted to do if you start working with Airflow or if you've worked with ETL tools in the past is passing data from one task to another. And actually this is an Airflow anti-pattern. 
And th so there's no pipelining between tasks in the sense that a task has to finish executing before its downstream tasks can start uh, running. And um, the reason for this is that because Airflow is designed to run on multiple workers, um, you need each task to be able to read and write from sources that are not local, so that they're accessible to all of the workers. Um, so what I said about explicit documentation of your data transformations is not entirely true. So it's true at a task, like higher level task level, but you won't have documentation of the yeah, inner workings of each task. So it's just partially true. Um, and then there is a way to share small bits of information between tasks, which is using XCOM for cross-communication. Okay, so one thing we ran into when, when using Airflow is that Airflow by default, it reads um, the DAG definitions that you define in an Airflow directory. So you set it in the Airflow configuration. Um, and one thing we wanted to do, so we ended up with a directory with a lot of DAG definitions. It was kind of messy, and we kind of wanted to separate them over different repositories um, for, by domain logic. And um, there's a trick to do this. So here you can see like a very simple co code snippet. And although it looks very hacky, this is actually suggested in the Airflow documentation as a way to kind of dynamically create DAGs and load them. Okay, so I'll just briefly mention the command line. So while most of the stuff that you need to do with Airflow or most of the, yeah, the operations that you might need to do, you can do through the, uh, the, the UI. There is a command line, and it was, for us it was very useful when using Airflow. So one example would be if you want to clear all of the runs for a DAG or if you want to backfill, so trigger some tasks between two execution dates without unpausing the DAG or if you just want to test a task um, without having to involve the scheduler. So the easiest way to start, I would suggest, is using Docker. Um, of course, you can also just install it locally on your own environment. Um, the nice thing of Docker is that it'll also, so if you use this command, it'll um, also spin up a container uh, hosting Postgres database. And so that allows you to actually look into the metadata database, which is also really good to understand kind of how the scheduler works. And you can also, um, yeah, so directly do commands on the database, so clear tasks and stuff like this. Um, for deployment, we at HelloFresh were using Ansible. There are lots of roles out there, and we were running um, Airflow web server and scheduler on supervisor, but there's many ways to do this. So you might be wondering at this point, okay, I thought she was going to talk about Spark. <laughs> What's up? Why haven't we talked about this? Um, and or maybe not. <laughs> so the reason I want to talk about Spark is actually because at HelloFresh, we were mainly triggering Spark jobs with Airflow. So this is why I bring it in, because most of our ETLs were coded in Spark. So very, very briefly, for those of you who aren't familiar with Spark, it's uh, an open source framework for distributed computation. And it's written in Java, but has a very nice Python API and also has a very nice SQL API. And you can see this very, very simple code snippet that allows to do some transformations, and this can run on as many machines as you want, right? So this is the nice thing of Spark and the reason why many people use it. It's if you have big data sets, it helps you deal with them. Um, so this is the configuration we were using at HelloFresh. Basically, we have a Hadoop cluster, and we installed Airflow on a Hadoop gateway node. So this gateway node, it has access to Hadoop resources. It can submit a Spark job running a Spark submit command. Um, and the way we were doing this was using just bash operators running command line um, operations. But there's also now in the Airflow contrib operators, you can find the Spark submit operator, which you can use for this purpose. So it works in a similar way. It's just a command line Spark submit. Um, if you run Spark in client mode in this set layout, the nice thing is that Airflow will have the logs of your Spark job. Of course, the disadvantage is that then your machine hosting Airflow will be using resources for running the Spark driver. So if instead you choose to run this on cluster mode, the disadvantage is that you'll, you won't have the logs centralized in Airflow, which is actually a very nice feature, but instead you'll have to look for them somewhere else if your task fails. And also you'll have to set another downstream task to check if your Spark job actually finished. So one example could be like a file sensor to check if the files that you expect your Spark job to generate are there. Okay, another option actually to uh, run Spark jobs using Airflow is instead to use the Spark REST API. 
And so here you would use an HTTP operator to submit Spark jobs. And um, this same operator, so it would make an HTTP request to submit a job and then um, future requests to poll, poll when the job is finished. And this is a similar approach taken by the Databricks submit uh, run operator, so um, yeah. And finally, and this is actually for me a, a very interesting use of Airflow, we didn't do it ourselves, but it would be to incorporate inside of Airflow tasks to actually spin up, for example, Elastic MapReduce or some other form of machine to run your job. So in your pipeline, spin up a cluster, run your job, and then spin it down again. And this you could also do um, with Airflow. So here's a reference to some, an organization that's doing that. I, I thought it was quite interesting. Uh, and I saw that there are Elastic MapReduce create job flow and adds that, so basically operators in the contrib operators that will allow you to submit jobs, but as far as I could see, none to spin up and provision a cluster. So this is something you might have to extend to Airflow for. Okay, so in summary, <laughs> um, batch data processing is still widely used and in whichever form it takes, the principles of ETLing are still present. Um, Python makes it possible for people who are not software developers uh, to actually code batch data processing jobs. Um, Airflow is a great tool if you want the benefits of like a UI um, ETLing tool with the flexibility of coding. And finally, although Airflow can run distributed, um, if you have a separate uh, cluster for distributing your jobs, you might not need to run Airflow distributed, but instead you just trigger jobs to this external place and there the distribution happens. Okay, so that's it from my side and I welcome any questions you might have. Mm -hmm. How would I take this back and specify, okay, you have to look at this table, and look at this binary tree, and create a new uh, record uh, for it? Do I know about it? Okay. So Airflow has the concept of hooks, which are basically containing the connection to the databases and then the operators. And because I mentioned operators are normally atomic, so you wouldn't, for example, pass only very small bits of information from one operator to another but you could just use a Python operator and use the hook to actually connect to the database and then run an SQL command, for example. So it's, it's really flexible in that sense. And the nice thing is if you're using the same database across multiple um, DACs, then you can use just, just define the connection information once and then just reference it with a connection ID from different DACs. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Or? Yeah. Yes, yes, so you could, I mean, normally um, in ETLing, so it, it would depend on how you want to structure your destination. Um, normally you recreate, like it's not that common to update it, so, but it, I mean, you could implement it this way, this is up to your choice, right? But normally it would be faster to just drop the rows that you incorporated and reload them. Um, this is a common approach in, in like data warehousing because it's faster to just insert than to do updates. But I mean, it's up, it's up to you. Yeah. It was very quick. Oh, sorry, I couldn't continue. Okay, so starting to use it was very easy. Um, yeah, and this is also kind of why I'm an evangelist of it. Um, like I said, the most difficult part to understand was the scheduler, and that's why I kind of made an emphasis on this. And it's also important to understand that it's designed for batch processing, so you shouldn't try to use Airflow for some sort of streaming. It's not gonna be helpful for that. Um, and open challenges, not so much with Airflow, but for me particularly, I would like to 
create pipelines where you actually spin up um, external resources, use them only for that pipeline, and then spin them down again. Because in the, L in the end, for batch processing jobs, you don't need to have, uh, for example, a cluster running all the time unless you have like multiple users of it. But you might benefit a lot in terms of resources from just spinning it up and then spinning it down again. So this would be from my side. But in terms of working with a tool, I was actually quite happy. And also, so things that I, I missed in the past, I see that there are um, new issues being created and they're being tackled pretty quickly. So the community is actually quite active. It's very nice. So, I mean, for me, it will always, even if you're just running one or two jobs, you already have a benefit from it because you can, so one thing that cron jobs won't give you is kind of rescheduling if something fails. And this is already given for you in Airflow. And also notifications. So you'll get an email if it fails. This is also not present in just plain cron. So for me, it's like almost never too early. Um, yeah, so if, if, and as soon as you have dependencies, then for sure go for Airflow because it's super annoying to have to coordinate between different cron schedules and then if your first job takes longer than it's supposed to, then the other one, you'll have to rerun it. So yeah, for, for us, we were using cron at the beginning and, and as soon as we switched to Airflow, it was really a big relief to have that. More questions? Okay. Thanks again. <laughs>